Congratulations, and I'm happy to welcome you here to this policy forum on the Kampala Convention and internal displacement, a meeting in which we are joined as co-organizers by the permanent missions to the United Nations of Finland and of Kenya, and by the office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. The Convention for the Protection and Assistance of Internally Displaced Persons in Africa, otherwise known as the Kampala Convention, was adopted in October 2009 by the African Union and is close to achieving the ratification by the 15 nations that it needs to enter into force. That said, the Convention is already having a positive effect because more than 30 nations have already signed it, a step short of ratification, but a step that commits those states to refraining from acts that would defeat the objective and the purpose of the Convention. Our panelist has just arrived. <laughs> Please. Um, as you know, the Convention declares that states have the primary responsibility for providing protection and humanitarian assistance to internally displaced persons, or IDPs, and must develop appropriate strategies and laws to further that goal. IPI participated in that AU Special Summit on Forced Displacement in October 2009 in Kampala that led to the adoption of the Convention. IPI co-organized with the Office of the Ugandan Prime Minister, the Norwegian Foreign Ministry, and the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center of the Norwegian Refugee Council, a ministerial lunch on the margins of the summit that aimed to put forward displacement excuse me, that aimed to put forced displacement in Africa in a historical, political, <laughs> economic, social, and developmental context. The subject has remained a focus of IPI's work, and this past March, IPI co-organized with IDMC a high-level roundtable luncheon in New York on the occasion of the launch of the IDMC annual report on displacement. That event underlined the centrality of the Kampala Convention, and more broadly of legal and policy frameworks addressing the plight of IDPs. And finally, the issue of internal displacement is taking on a renewed importance for IPI today as we work to develop a new program on humanitarian affairs, led by senior policy analyst Jeremy Labbe, to complement our existing peace and security programs. We have assembled a very distinguished panel, and you have their biographies in your papers, so I will just introduce them briefly here. Our first speaker, and the man who is going to carry forward this discussion as our chairman this afternoon, is Jarmo Vinanen, the permanent representative of Finland to the United Nations, and also, I am happy to note, a member of IPI's International Advisory Council. Prior to taking up his current post in April 2009, Ambassador Vinanen was Secretary General and Chief of Cabinet to the President of Finland. George Okoth Obo, a veteran of 27 years at the office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, has been Director of the Regional Bureau for Africa at UNHCR headquarters in Geneva since July of 2009. Adonia Ayabare is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Uganda, a position he's occupying for the second time, since he was previously in that post from 2005 to 2009. For a period between those two assignments, he was here at IPI as Director of our Africa program, where his responsibilities included supporting efforts to strengthen the capacity of the African Union in the management and resolution of conflict. And finally, Josephine Ojiambo has been the Deputy Permanent Representative of Kenya since June of 2010. Prior to that, she had extensive experience in a variety of areas, including international health, women's rights, and community development. So uh, it is my pleasure now to turn this over to our chairman today, Ambassador Jarmo Vinanen of Finland. Jarmo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Warren, for that introduction, and all from, from my, my side, welcome to all to this event. As you can see, we have a very knowledgeable high-level panel here, 
uh, speaking about the issues which are very important for us, the plight of the internally displaced people. Before I, I give the floor to the panelists to make the introductory remarks, I'm going to say a couple of words and then we go from, from we will hear from the each of the panelists. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the Convention for the Protection and Assistance of Interna Internally Displaced Persons in Africa is a milestone achievement. The Kampala Convention is a landmark and unique instrument that serves as an example to other regions in the protection of IDPs. By adopting this convention, African countries have demonstrated their firm commitment and leadership to overcome challenges related to the internally displaced persons. Only African ownership and determined action can implement the Kampala Convention and can, can lead to genuine progress and development to take place. Of course, it is the international community's res responsibility to support the African countries, of course, in these efforts. Displacement is one of the most demanding contemporary challenges affecting the African continent. Every year, leading to increased poverty, human suffering, and inequality. Despite significant efforts and progress, still millions of new people continue to be displaced annually as results of conflicts or natural disasters. Unfortunately, the effects of the climate change will most likely aggravate this, this trend and increase the number of disaster displa displaced people. IDPs are frequently among the most vulnerable people in humanitarian crises. My own country, Finland, is truly committed to promoting the rights of the internal, internally displaced people. We strongly support the Kampala Convention and the Plan of Action for implementing this. In this regard, Finland has supported the organization of the first ECOWAS Ministerial Conference on Humanitarian Assistance and Internal Displace, Displacement, which, which took place in Abuja, Nigeria, July this year. As a result of concerted efforts, as we heard from, from Warren, on the 40 countries have already signed to the treaty and the ratification stands at 14. I, of course, from my own part, urge all African states to ratify the Kampala Convention and deposit the instruments as soon as possible. Through UN agencies, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movements and NGOs, Finland ha has this year challenged Challenged, channeled around 90 million euros to humanitarian assistance, of which more than 50% was allocated to Africa. The Kampala Convention is based on the fundamental principle that states bear the primary responsibility of providing protection and assistance to the IDPs. The Convention also calls upon states to play the leading role in coordinating humanitarian relief efforts and ensuring respect for the human rights of IDPs. The humanitarian reform process adopted in 2005 and the related cluster approach have helped the international system to overcome many of the past deficiencies related to the international humanitarian system. Finland has been active supporter of the UN humanitarian reform its cluster system and funding mechanisms from the very beginning. The governments of the affected countries have the primary role in initiating, planning, coordinating and implementing humanitarian response at the country level. A critical question for the international humanitarian system is the future, is how to better support the national authorities in fulfilling their responsibility to respond to the crisis. Meaningful and effective humanitarian response in support to international displaced populations can only be achieved by strengthening the role of states in tandem with the humanitarian principles. We need to make extra effort in order to build a more inclusive general humanitarian system. We have to work harder to foster trust and understanding between different actors. Wider participation and ownership of the humanitarian agenda by the affected countries and local communities is crucial of crucial importance if we want to guarantee the success of the humanitarian endeavor in the future. 
I will stop there and now I give the floor to our first panelist who is George Ogot Obo, who is the Director of Regional Bureau for Africa at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. As we heard, you have had this duty more than two years. You have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a bit higher. It's my great delight to have been invited here to renew my acquaintance with some of you whom I know uh, from before and uh, hopefully to make the acquaintance of others whom I'll be meeting for the first time. But uh, a particular delight, uh, Dr. Francis Deng, uh, a, a man I think whose name should be in the very title of this convention um, for the reasons that I'll allude to in some of uh, uh, my, my, my remarks. <clears throat> As we speak today, there are 12 million internally displaced persons on uh, the African continent. And that in itself, I think, is an important anchor point for looking at the legal framework that this continent has now um, taken upon itself as the regulatory framework for this scourge. But the importance is not just in numbers. Right now, as we speak, people are being forcibly displaced from uh, places that have been their homes. Last week alone, last week alone, in, um, the, in, the, in, the, in the situation that is going on between the two Sudans, anything up to 100,000 people became dislocated as internally displaced persons. In a period of just about five days, um, in February and March this year, in the crisis that was taking place in Cote d'Ivoire, more than a million people in a period of just about four days, were turned into internally uh, displaced uh, uh, persons. <clears throat> so um, in numbers alone, this is grave. But if I take that same situation to post a little bit the points around which I would particularly like to review with you what this convention represents. What do these situations re represent? The fact that a million people can be displaced in a period of just days, what does that represent? It seems to me that it brings to the fore a crisis of accountable governance. It seems to me that it brings to the fore the imperative to have regulated state behavior in particular, especially in those cases where these instances um, are attributable <coughs> to um, state um, dereliction. It seems to me that the rule of law seems to be fun an, 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 a necessary imperative as the basis on which the relationship between a state and its citizens are uh, governed. So if we look at, if we look at those as some of the elements against which to do a quick review of what this convention represents, what then are some of the features against which this convention should be looked at, and particularly the great applause that, as we have had already in the remarks that uh, have been made at the beginning of this uh, discussion, is that applause justified? I think yes, because first of all, as has been pointed out, this represents the first universal instrument to dispose of the legal regulation and particularly the protection and addressing the plight of internally displaced persons as binding law. But there is, however, a discussion point that I would like us to return to, whether in fact that in itself says anything unless it is linked to state behavior in an accountable way. And I say that in particular in reference to the guiding principles, which by the time this convention became law had been with us for a full decade, and to see whether there is an expectation of um, in, in instituting a behavior in terms of governance that would be different than that which we could take for granted under the guiding principles. <clears throat> The second feature of this convention, which I myself, I think, have been very strongly attracted to, is that both in its words and in the process from which the convention um, um, made its appearance, it somehow depoliticized the IDP issue from the province of state exclusivity, the sovereign right of states, etc., to one of legal mediation as the basis 
on which the plight of refugees would be addressed. I personally applaud and try to promote this feature of the convention a lot in discussions such as this one and in the example that I will turn to in a moment, in that in the work, for instance, of UNHCR, both before the convention and I would say even right now, one of the greatest obstacles that we always ran into in doing basic things, in doing basic things, in helping people who are in distress, in finding out information as Dr. Deng uh, did in his many years of work in trying to just get the situation new, uh, known better, was that we always ran into this um, uh, wall of state sovereignty um, um, as, as really uh, uh, a, a wall that we could not overcome. The convention both lowers that wall in cementing state of sovereignty, not as um, a barrier beyond which we cannot look, but as a responsibility to help and assist people in distress. So this is something that I think has to be said uh, from, for, 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 for the convention. Now, not only does the convention then harden the law, the soft law as it existed, exists, it also extends considerably its frontiers. In terms of things such as what? For example, in bringing within the, uh, within the range of responsibilities and obligations that it establishes, not only states, but other actors as well, particularly non-state actors, including ourselves as international humanitarian agencies, but there are also non-state actors, such as rebel organizations, rebel movements that are brought within the responsibilities here. Some indeed point to this as a point of weakness of the convention. I think, however, that in affirming the rights and the imperative for us to respond, to um, this large number of people in distress that this is something only to be um, afforded. So just let me run very quickly then through some other things. The definition then of internal displacement. Um, the convention carries it much further than where it picked it up from the guiding principles. Namely, not only are we looking at people who have been forced into displacement from uh, uh, man-made uh, conditions, but also natural uh, conditions such as climate change in particular disasters, but also development projects, development programs are mentioned in there. This is an interesting one. This is a very interesting one because, again, we see um, in a number of countries uh, on the African continent, just let's take the development of roads, for instance, where people are moved, dams, where people are moved and so forth. The convention sets a, a series of very um, important mandatory obligations, and we have to see whether that actually works. <laughs> I would like to pick one thing which sets this convention apart from a number of other instruments, and for example, as compared with the Refugee Convention, <coughs> um, which is the one that uh, uh, we also work with on a day-to-day -day basis. But the contrast also stands out if you look at the convention as compared, for instance, with uh, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Most of the instruments tend to dispose of the rights of people who can claim protection, assistance, and the right to solutions within them to express them in descriptive terms, i.e. people shall enjoy, refugees shall not be, and so forth. The convention turns that all around into a set of prescriptions that qualify and measure state behavior. So the character of the convention is states shall, states shall not, and other actors shall and shall not. I think this is a very unique basis for those of us who in this room, for example, who represent advocacy, those of us who are in this room who represent capacity building, the government of Finland, for example, which has supported, if I take just one of the issues that we have worked together on, accessions and so forth, because the direct entry in the dialogue with states is about a particular form of behavior that is established uh, in the convention. And then uh, lastly, and this I say because it is important to uh, one of the points that I would like to discuss, the convention sets a regional platform, a regional platform for the African countries for regional cooperation to address displacement and crisis, generally speaking. 
There would be many other things which, if the time was available, would have gone through. But Mr. Chairman, if you allow me, I could stop there in terms of describing what the convention represents and then turn to some of the issues which help us have some kind of vision as to where this convention goes and where it takes us, uh, whether as states, as advocates, and above all in terms of the plight of um, um, <clears throat> internally displaced persons. First of all, for an instrument which has now been in existence for um, going to three years, what has it represented in terms of a fidelity on the part of states to a convention which they themselves have described as homegrown and which was developed in the continent and concluded in the Congo? What do we see? Can we start to see, if not direct obligatory behavior, then a trend towards a custom of some kind? Here, it is impressive that the convention is now just one or two ratifications away from coming into force. Um, I am confident of 13 ratifications. My colleague Udo, as we were walking here, was telling me it is 14. But in any case, that is uh, just one shot, which is good. I mean, it would be interesting to look at those countries that have actually ratified the convention today and contrast us with those who have not yet ratified the convention and see what reading we should take from there. But I think the convention is about to come into being, and I think that is a good thing. The second thing is that once this convention actually comes to life, is it ready to go? Is it ready to start moving? Aha, uh -huh. so here's some discussion point. Perhaps the greatest shortcoming of this convention, it is being established virtually without arrangements for implementation. It has very, very weak arrangements for accountability. Effectively, the thing that it says is that states shall establish a conference of parties to monitor implementation. What does that mean? How shall implementation be monitored? What is this conference going to be? Is it going to be a standing institutional arrangement? Is it going to be an event? Is it going to be uh, a structure? We really don't know. More than that, if you look at the other pro, uh, provisions of the instrument, which again, as, as, as I mentioned from the very onset, this convention is all about instituting, about watching, about measuring, and about judging behavior, about judging state behavior. So if we look at and interrogate the convention from that point of view, I have to say that I myself would have expected much more than is um, within the um, uh, convention itself. The other point that the convention, I hope, does not share with other conventions that we have on the continent is that it becomes a framework of law, but not of rule of law. Because there we have, unfortunately, to accept that we have had fantastic conventional frameworks. I already mentioned some of them. For instance, the, um, um, the, the African Charter, which I think from end to end is unmatched as an instrument laying down the rights of people. And surely, if that convention uh, affected state behavior relative to its citizens, we surely shouldn't be seeing some of the things that we're seeing on this continent. And why is that? I think it's because we often have legislative frameworks without the rule of law. We often have constitutions without constitutionalism. And what is it that is going to shift or to make to use this veritable framework in legal terms into one that really cements rule of behavior that is mediated by law? And here now I want to allude to something that uh, uh, Dr. Deng mentioned to me in 1992 when he uh, first did the um, analysis on uh, the existing international uh, law for the protection of um, internally displaced persons, because at that time already there was a raging debate about do we need a specific instrument for the governance of um, the plight of refugees, or was international law as it existed at the time sufficient? And in a conference in Geneva, Professor Deng used the following words. He said, if the principles existing international law already then, more than a decade ago, were implemented only half the time, there would be a revolution in the condition and the plight of the internally displaced persons. 
So the test really that this convention, I think, faces is that it should be applauded for all the things that I have said at the beginning of my remarks for providing now a conventional a binding framework for hardening the soft law that we had. But its true test, its true test shall be in um, the behavior and the practices that should follow. So if I move now to conclude and you allow me then to refer to some of the other discussion points that I have come to share um, 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 uh, with, with, with you here, it, it would be really um, the, the following. The first one is that um, while in many respects the features that it represents should be carried forward, should be imaged, should be um, multiplied elsewhere, the convention should not be romanticized. The convention should not be seen as itself the thing which changes the plight of internally displaced persons. The convention in this regard should not fall prey to um, what the 1969 OAU Convention on Refugees, on Refugees suffered, which was that decades and decades of this warm and comforting response to it in academic circles, in advocacy, in even our organization in, 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 in UNHCR in the work that we did, whereas on a day-to-day -day basis, states were behaving extremely badly with the treatment that refugees were receiving. Whereas states were behaving even worse in terms of the obligations that were established in the convention, as this convention does, in preventing in ensuring sufficient response in protection and assistance terms and in ensuring that um, the refugees once they have been, persons once they have been unfortunately um, displaced as refugees that they can be moved on to a solution. So this is the trajectory in which intellectual appreciation such as we are having here this afternoon meets with advocacy, meets with efforts to move this convention forward, and that trajectory leads absolutely into tested, measurable behavior. The other thing that I would like to say is that we need also to look at other dynamics than the dynamics of jurisprudence. The dynamics of jurisprudence are important enough, and we could say more about them than those that I have said. But as I also alluded to in citing what is happening right now, we have to look at other regimes which in their own right are especially the route in which displacement occurs or collateralize the jurisprudential behavior that will make a difference to refugees. And the most important, the most important dynamic that must look, be looked at today in order for the convention to do what it promises in words is accountable politics and accountable governance. It is only if everything that the convention says in terms of prevention, everything that the convention mandates in terms of extending legal and other measures of assistance to IDPs, where that becomes demonstrable behavior and is itself not behavior which rests solely in the domain of the convention, it is only then and there that we should start to see in reality what the convention promises uh, um, 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 and, uh, inwards. And then finally, the friendly pressure which should continue around this convention. The convention would not have come into being if the forces of all that are friendly to the plight of IDPs, and here I would particularly really like to recognize civil society, which had a strong role in the legislative history of the convention, because the convention went through terrible times. Those of you who were in Kampala during the process of its adoption will remember that uh, at one point it had uh, virtually come, um, uh, been, been come to a halt. And this was possible for the convention to move forward and become law only because of the multiplication of all the forces around it. This must continue. 
must continue in advocacy, must continue in support to give effect to the convention itself when it becomes ratified. And the first point of action that the convention itself spells out upon ratification is its domestication into um, um, legislative, um, uh, national legislative um, enactments. Let us not allow this convention to fall prey to what its sister on the continent, the Great Lakes Protocol, has already fallen prey to. It is a convention that brings together no more than just 11 states. The first thing those states were obliged to implement nationally was to create legislative uh, enact enactments. Today, seven years after that protocol came into being, those enactments have not happened. So if you allow me to conclude with just this one word of what I call collateral friendly pressure, it is the one thing that from the UNHCR standpoint, but also as an African myself on a continent in which I would like to see this number of 11 million definitely come down in a best case scenario to zero, and what is happening in Sudan, what happened in Cote d'Ivoire, what is happening in other places, i.e. that even as we talk, people are being dislocated from um, their homes and being forced to seek safety elsewhere. That is what I would like for my continent. The biggest dynamic that I would appeal to from this audience here is this friendly collateral dynamic of advocacy and pressure for the thing to come into. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. You took up very many important issues about the, the convention and also about how you would like to see it be implemented. I mean, very, very many pertinent issues and also what, what should happen now in the future ending very with a very strong plea on the collateral friendly pressure, uh, very strong words. Uh, now I give the floor to my good colleague Adonia Ayabar, who is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Uganda to the United Nations. And as we heard before, these two terms in this duty, so he's in a very familiar places, place, has been serving a long time here at the IPI. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, IPI, for bringing me back to uh, be a speaker um, uh, at the Kampara Convention and Internal Displacement. Um, as Warren mentioned at the beginning, um, um, IPI and me, as a director of Africa, were part of the Kampara Convention and organized the side event uh, with uh, IDMC in Geneva. Um, my entry point into this discussion is really um, and let me thank my compatriot, uh, Mr. Obo, and uh, my colleague, uh, Josephine Odiambo. Um, if the chair was not around, this risked to be having an East African panel, because <laughs> uh, Josephine is Finland, from Kenya. Finland is an African country. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically, my, my remarks are going to zero around, and also Francis Deng and, uh, for recognizing him, who is really an intellectual giant in this field, uh, and his notion of sovereignty as responsibility underlines uh, the thinking behind this convention and many other conventions dealing with IDPs and um, international law in general. Uh, basically, my point is that this convention shows that Africa is really taking a lead in norm setting and norm creation, really. It's, uh, it's the only convention, if I'm not mistaken, of its kind in the world. And Africa has taken a lead in, in really embarking on it. So, so I, I really call for, when we are carrying out a discussion, to keep that in mind. Africa is taking a lead in norm creation, not only on IDPs, on issues that we tend here at the UN sort of sometimes dramatize, like responsibility to protect in the AU Constitutive Act. Um, of course, all of you know that Africa is in the process, really, of creating norms at the, at the continent and the sub-regional and national level. And I think that is very important uh, to press the convention in that context. Um, and another point is, of course, state building. It's one, it's one thing to, uh, to sit here and we talk about responsibilities of state and not to recognize uh, that uh, states in Africa are relatively new speaking, historically. And when you go into the history of Europe and others where states have built, it has taken time. State building and state formation is, is not a business. It's, it's not a walk in the park. Uh, note that IDPs and others are really terrible incidents, and, uh, and, and I think as Africa we can do better, but 
we shouldn't escape that picture that we are creating norms, we are building responsible states. Uh, I was in Kampara, uh, and I'd been following the negotiations of this convention. I think really African states are committed. You know, when you saw the leaders that were in Kampara and the negotiations in the African Union, which is an intergovernmental organization, which is a political organization by nature, and, and politics will always interfere, but I think what I saw was commitment and ratification as 14 members have ratified. It's a sign of political commitment uh, that Africa is committed to really, this is their own convention. And I'm very, very optimistic that the discussions, the quality of discussions and debates uh, are not reminiscent of the past. I think there is real measurable commitment that 30 states signed this convention and 14 have ratified it. Uh, I think uh, I tend to sort of agree and then disagree with my, uh, my compatriot. I think civil society pressure and advocacy, yes, but it should be sort of encouraging and, and because we, we have a tendency to really, uh, this is a very, very uh, sort of, the IDP is humanitarian, but political situation, polit a political issue also in some African countries. People are sensitive of their sovereignty. Uh, uh, so as we call for implementation and for ratification, uh, we should work with states and try to sort of develop their capacity in, in, in trying to really cut out the convention forward. Uh, otherwise, you'll create a situation whereby uh, you, 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 you sort of go into what you call corrato, instead of corrato pressure, you go into corrato damage. <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, like I said, I think this is an African convention and I'm very optimistic that it will be, it will be implemented. Um, another point really, <coughs> talking on behalf of my country, Uganda, is that we have already ratified the convention out of our own and our own processes, uh, given our history of conflict and in, uh, internal displacement, and also as a country that hosted the Kampara uh, uh, meeting that that uh, we are signing uh, took place. Uh, but even before that, uh, Uganda had its own uh, domestic legislation on IDPs. Uh, which was really a very sort of progressive document. And, and many other African countries have legal frameworks dealing with IDPs. And building on that, I think, building on those blocks at the national level is very important. Uh, and uh, if you are holding people accountable, you shouldn't only hold them accountable on what they have signed at the continental level, but at the domestic level as well. Uh, because that is even more hard law. It's not soft law, it's national registration. Uh, and also recognize those efforts at the national level. Um, uh, I think implementation, uh, uh, you, uh, you talked about rightly so that state parties will see it. I think implementation, I think, should also be African-owned. Uh, and and uh, external call for implementation should be measured and should, should rhyme with uh, the mechanism that will be, uh, that will be taken into, uh, into in, uh, put into press. Um, Basically, those are um, uh, the few remarks uh, I wanted to, to, to flash up. Thanks. Thank you very much, Adonian, on, on that insight on, the, on these matters. There has been certainly real measurable progress on, on, on this issue. It is, it is very important. And now, last but certainly not least, I give the floor to um, Josephine Ochiambo, who is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Kenya been here now one and a half years, yeah. And she enjoying very much working together with you. Please, you have the floor. I too want to thank IPI, Warren, for making this event possible today. I'd like to also thank our colleague, the PR of Finland, being here to moderate our event. And then also welcome to New York, and it's nice to see you again, Giorgio Kothobu, who spent many years working in Nairobi, in Kenya. I, all right, is that better? <laughs> okay, so I hope my initial remarks were heard, and if not, I'll repeat them. I also want to thank IPI, and in particular Warren, for making this event possible today. My colleague, the PR, senior colleague, the PR of Finland. I also want to therefore welcome Giorgio Kothobu to New York, 
George worked many years based out of Nairobi with UNHCR and is actually more than a brother to us in Kenya. I think we might once want to extend a welcome to him to become part of our nation. Thank you for the hard work you did there. I also therefore want to also acknowledge my colleague Adonia here. Like he said, this could be easily interpreted to be an East African function where Finland is a member of the region. It's nice to be together on this platform today. And then within the audience, excellencies, I want to acknowledge you. And I want to in particular single out uh, the PR of Nigeria, Ambassador Ogu, who is present with us today, and her current role as president of UN Women. As you heard in my introduction, in the introduction made by Warren, most of my experience is operational, and I will bring that to the fore when I make my remarks. And in particular, in the setting of IDPs, my experience has been that of working with women and children who are internally displaced. And therefore, I'm happy that she's here amongst us today, and also my co senior colleague, the PR from Ethiopia. Mr. Deng, compliments and happy to see you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mine will be there for just to reflect on Kenya's experience because a lot has been said about the overall convention, about its merits and the challenges um, that it brings to the fore. I think I'll just say one word that this convention builds on synergy. It builds on synergy between international actors and such as the representative of, us, of the Secretary General on the human rights of internally displaced persons he also has a role to play in the implementation of this convention. I mention him because I'll mention him also in Kenya's experience. And international organizations around the table, and indeed the Africa Union in its efforts to address internal displacement. I need to say at the outset that Kenya hasn't signed or ratified the convention. And these are the challenges that I think I'd like to address in terms of way forward. But having said that, that we have policy in place Adonia has expressed the fact that many member states have national policy and program in place with which they are addressing the issues of IDPs amongst them. I also want to say with the provisions of my country's recently promulgated constitution, once this convention is ratified, it will immediately become part of the laws of the land. So already we have a framework in place for its quick adoption and enforcement. And so like others, we understand the convention to cover measures to be taken to prevent displacement, to protect and assist the internally displaced, and to seek durable solutions to the problems of displacement. And lastly, to move from paper to action. I'll talk about conflict in the Kenyan setting, and I draw from the recent events of 2007-8 in my country. And just to say that our government and the community of Kenyans were able to mount effective and quotable interventions to implement the policy already existing and the programs that are actually reflected in the provisions of the convention. So regarding the protection of the displaced, during transit, IDPs in that setting were escorted to safer settings by the administration police. So this shows you the role of government in support and protection of the IDPs. And not only with the administrative police, with their local leaders. In these settings, which were commonly camps, the IDPs were protected again by the administrative police. Once in a while, the security in these camps was violated, and many times by what you'd call unidentified non-state actors. And on the one hand, one must indeed appreciate their role in providing relief and humanitarian aid to those in the camp settings. But in other situations, Sometimes they themselves would be the ones who would violate those within the camp settings, particularly when coming from communities that were surrounding the camps where there was a dire need for basic social services. And more distressing for the women in the areas that would be related to women's rights on the issues of rape and violation of the women. Regarding durable solutions, our government put in place interventions at an intersectoral platform in the Ministry of Special Programs in the Office of the President. This platform coordinated the provision of relief and humanitarian inputs to the IDPs and later provided for the return of the IDPs to their original settings or supported their integration into their new settings. Once the emergency phase was over, a program within the Office of the President charged with reform undertook national programs on educating Kenyans in reconciliation, peaceful coexistence, and reintegration. 
the most notable contribution to the restoration of peace and reintegration of the IDPs at that time was by the two principals of our coalition government. After the signing of a mediated peace accord, the handshake of the two principals was televised live across the country. This gesture of good faith resonated with all Kenyans and led to the resettlement project dubbed in Kiswahili, Operation Rudi Nyumbani, meaning Operation Return Home. This operation was replicated at grassroots settings by local leaders of all political parties to stimulate the reintegration of IDPs. I've described all that because I want to resonate with some of the issues brought forward about governance and the arrangement to implement the convention. I want to state that the SG's representative, whom I've mentioned earlier, visited Kenya and remarked in his report that he appreciated and commended us for the policy and program and the legal frameworks already in place, of course, and did encourage us to look at the areas of data, its collection and management, and indeed the ratification of the convention. I now draw on our experience with the IDP framework in relation to environmental and climate change issues. Our government has set up in the same Ministry of State for Special Programs a mandate and functions in collaboration with other ministries such as that of provincial administration, internal security, and our national environmental management organization, a platform again to deal with displacement due to natural disasters, climate change, and other environmental challenges. Reforms have been undertaken in the very institutions I've mentioned, but also within government under this platform on the issues of the development of a legal framework, first of all, for handling um, natural disasters, but also in a broader sense to also address conflict like I've mentioned earlier. But when it comes to the issues of natural disasters, we have in place interventions that look at preparedness to respond to the disasters, the issues of dams and dikes that are being built at program level to arrest floods, and the support to more and more land being brought under irrigation to boost food production. So this is part of the intersectoral platform under the ministry. Our government has also instituted the buyback of livestock. And this program is in place to ensure that animals do not die during drought because we are reliant on our livestock and that resistant, drought resistant crops have been introduced to the arid and semi-arid areas. Again, this is part of the framework for handling in quotes, the prevention or the mitigation of the need for us to have IDPs. Our government is also bringing services closer to people and when disaster strikes in a natural mode, mobile schools and health facilities are sent out to where the populations exist. So we have clear policies therefore under the same framework for resettlement and also for compensation, rehabilitation and reconstruction following disasters. This ministry formulates and coordinates policies relating also to the IDPs. Um, it does this both on the long-term basis but also as an emergency response. So the ministry together with other stakeholders has formulated a national policy for disaster management in Kenya and an action plan. So we have the documents and we do have documents that we use and call to action. Owing to the enormous resources sought to deal with the many demands to resettle IDPs in Kenya, and generally to coordinate humanitarian disasters in Kenya, we have established a humanitarian fund. The government has also put in place a national disaster management committee <coughs> that draws membership not only from the ministries and departments, such as the military and even the police, but also from civil society and for in, from individuals and from private sector and philanthropies, and underscore their role working in tandem with government. So the same platform also works with locally elected officials, again, as part of its outreach. So I'll make a few comments, therefore, having shared some of our experiences on the way forward. Like the others around the table, we agree that any efforts to settle IDPs must include adoption of a policy and legal framework that's local but meets international and regional standards. Uh, efforts must focus on capacity building but around technical issues, for us, the challenges are registration of IDPs, their profiling, that's data collection and its management, and also assisted living and protection programs, as well as prevention and mitigation of internal displacement, and like I've mentioned, displacement that's the cause, that has been caused by 
natural disasters so that we can therefore have durable solutions for displacement. Due to the comprehensive nature of the convention with far-reaching implications, it's essential that the Africa Union and sub-regional groupings and individual countries hold forums to discuss the convention, its benefits and its implications. So events such as this one today are very important since we all get to hear the different experiences, share our best practice, and continue to encourage those who have not ratified to do the same and to domesticate it. I want to commend Finland's initiative in support of ECOWAS in the deliberations on the status of ratification and implementation of the convention, and actually say that this needs to be replicated in other regions, and call on the international community to come together to support the implementation of this convention by supporting the institutions and countries that deal with issues related to protection of a country's own civilians. Going back to capacity building, capacity has to be built in countries so that they don't feel challenged by the far-reaching measures required under the convention. The convention is very broad, going from prevention to actual protection to mitigation issues and to even reintegration. So the capacity needs to be provided for countries not to feel overburdened so that they can ratify this convention. And this uh, capacity building is an opportunity, and I, I, call, I recall George's remarks, to strengthen the rule of law, to strengthen governance, to address issues of human rights, but most important, to address development. This is a convention that should be working itself out of a job, meaning that its real objectives will be realized when there will be no more internal displacement, and therefore, indeed, no need to have that impl the implementation of the convention as it will be governing, indeed, no one if we have no IDPs. Those are my short remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Josephine. Thank you very much for sharing of, of Kenyan experiences on, on, on this matter. It was very good to hear from you and, and, and the what I would describe the whole of, of government approach on this matter. I mean, this is not an issue for just the department, it's an issue for everybody in the government and certainly. And of course, what you said about the national provisions on the internal displaced pe people, persons, as, as the previous speakers also, this is very important always that international legal instruments, of course, are very important, but the implementation happens on a country level always and, and that we shouldn't forget ever. Now we have um, a good half an hour possibility for approximately half an hour uh, for questions and comments. Let's take so that we take a couple of questions and then the panelists can, can answer those. And those who are taking the floor, please identify yourself and also say about your affiliation. The floor is open here in the front, please. Thank you, uh, William Verdone. In addition to being a board member of the University of Rajasthan, I'm also board chairman of African Views Organization. Uh, the history of the world is written with the blood of millions of displaced peoples. We can go to South America, we can talk about the Aboriginal in Australia, the American Indian, the slave trade, those who are escaping North Korea. Uh, where, where do you see all the work you've done in five to seven years? And do you think there are bridges that will be crossed and solidified? Thank you. Thank you very much. Another comment or question, please. Francis Deng. Special Advisor of the Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide. After all the wonderful, very generous things said about my role, I think wisdom would have dictated that I say nothing. Uh, at the same time, by the same token, uh, it would be untenable if I didn't make some comments. Uh, first of all, I very, very much appreciate uh, all the panelists and what you've said. I could say a lot, uh, but you have already indicated some of the challenges that confronted me when I was dealing with this problem for some 12 years. And perhaps one of the key factors which you have highlighted, and which I repeat, uh, was the importance of the responsibility of sovereignty. 
And I recall when I was given this assignment, knowing that it was internal and therefore very sensitive, I asked myself the question, how do I deal with this impossible situation? And in reflecting, I resorted to a work we had been doing at the Brookings Institution on how to approach the post-Cold War conflicts in Africa. And we developed the concept kindly referred to as sovereignty as responsibility. Now, sovereignty as responsibility, which I should say has evolved into now the responsibility to protect, has number one, the responsibility of the state, support for the state, and if all that fails, the international community is stepping in to fill the vacuum. So accountability in the end is critical. Now, George made a very important point that the normative framework is there, but implementation is lacking. And I recall when we were dealing with the IDP issue, there came not only the question of developing the appropriate normative framework, but institutional arrangements. And I suggested four op three options. Either creating a new UNHCR for IDPs, which nobody wanted to do, or designating one existing agency, assume responsibilities, and I suggested UNHCR, but uh, later on became a contested area because all the agencies wanted to get involved. So what was then agreed upon was the collaborative approach. Now, this is at the international level. When we talk regionally, the vacuum of that institutional uh, implementation mechanism is, is obviously there. So the question is, if we link the two, regional and international, what mechanisms are there in place to deal with this issue? Are we still stuck with the collaborative approach, or is it encouraging that UNHCR is increasingly assuming responsibility, that the barrier of the border which divides between refugees and IDPs is more or less facing? Responsibility to protect, which you mentioned. Sovereignty as responsibility. When we speak of sovereignty as responsibility, the intuitive feeling is that this is the responsibility of the state. When we speak of the responsibility to protect, although it has the same three pillars, the assumption is that we're talking of external elements coming in to protect. How do we deal with this issue of the responsibility of the state, which is the core of the convention, and the now assumed meaning of the responsibility to protect being an external responsibility to come in to protect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's take some comments and answers from the panelists on this matter. Uh, George, could you start? Yes, um, Williams, you don't mind if I call you William. Where shall we be five to seven years? Oh, I wish I really could uh, I imagine that. But clearly within the context of um, what the convention disposes, there are immediate low-hanging fruits that I think we should all work to achieve. The first of those is that the convention truly gets ratified because within the line of the convention, there is almost a roadmap that is built into the convention in terms of what follows ratification. So this universe of doable things, I think, is the starting point. Whether it actually happens or not, I really can't say. But I would very much hope, I would very much hope that once now we get into the convention, being a mediator of the rights, responsibilities, and the duties that it establishes, that in these three domains in which it has written those responsibilities, i.e. to prevent that people are forcibly displaced, to respond to the consequences of displacement, and to move towards a solution, that we will start to be on the path to this. And that today, displacement situations which are beyond the pale, such as in the Democratic Republic of Congo, for instance, where we have more than a million internally displaced persons, but only less than 200,000 who are touched 
by any structure of response and so on that as more and more the convention starts to be the basis on which these responses are delivered, that we get to more and more of them. Such as that we draw on the example of Uganda, for instance, where now from a time when we had 2.3 million people in displacement, today that entire population has come down to just something like 90,000 people, and even that is working to a conclusion. Will that happen? I can only say that I hope so. If I turn a little bit to, Francis, to, to Professor Francis Deng's uh, uh, <clears throat> point, um, what the convention itself speaks to in terms of institutional arrangements, it sets them up at three levels. And as I said, I unfortunately count myself in the group that is somewhat disappointed by this infrastructure. At the international level, at the international level, there was an opportunity for this convention when it was agreed in 2009 to pick up the collaborative arrangement, which is actually the word that it uses, and take it forward one way or the other. What the convention does is just to allude to it approvingly, and it stops there. It doesn't take it forward one way or the other. Secondly, at the regional level, at the regional level, the convention really does two things. One, it says that the convention as a whole shall be a regional framework, i.e. regional within the context of Africa for states to work together. I think that's a good thing, but I think some would have wished to see it spelled out a little bit in a way that compares with the way some mechanisms within the African continent have got structure, such as the peer review mechanism, for instance, or the African Court on um, uh, the African Commission on um, uh, Human Rights Commission, or the cover. But it just stops there. And as I mentioned earlier on, the convention provides for a conference of um, uh, of, of of parties, which is a. a a fantastic and powerful instrument in that it is those parts of the convention that actually talk about monitoring the implementation of um, the convention. But one would have wished to see much more. For example, if it is going to be a conference of only at least initially 15 states, what shall happen to the plight of internally displaced persons in a country that is itself not a member of those who have ratified the convention. Moreover, what are the instruments that shall be placed before the conference so as to monitor compliance? The convention doesn't talk even of a report, for example. It only says that in the context of the um, uh, Human Rights Commission, for example, the Continental Human Rights Commission, its report shall reflect on the IDB. So I think at that level, there is uh, uh, still a lot to be done. And then finally, at the national level, the chairperson, when we finished our remarks, um, said to, um, to, to Ms. Ojambio here that she, he would like to hear a little bit on the whole of government uh, uh, um, approach. This, in fact, was a specific provision that was um, featured in one of the drafts of the convention as it, it, it took, um, as, as it was shaped. Unfortunately, it did not survive. What now survives in the convention is a requirement that states establish effectively a department, a department to implement all this. So we have to see how that works. Eh? I think some would have wished that the convention actually aspires to try and achieve uh, more. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Josephine. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just add a few thoughts on where we'd like to be in five or seven years from Willy. Um, I think much more work needs to be done in terms of looking at the inclusion of civil society's contribution to, like we've said, in ensuring the implementation of this convention. And I think there are many opportunities within this uh, convention where there could be the involvement of civil society to support the efforts of states in terms of the implementation of the convention. I also think that in the next five to seven years, much, many of the states that have actually ratified and will be implementing the Kampala Convention will have done a lot to modify national criminal law. So we'll see a lot of change in the processes of uh, penalization for violation of criminal 
well, for violating law, but in specific criminal law. Um, I think that in the next five to seven years, we will be able, where there is implementation of the convention, to eradicate the root causes of displacement, particularly in settings where those root causes are linked to issues both of conflict and in specific particular areas of nat uh, natural disasters. And I say that because I think that where you have compliance by the state and non-state actors for the implementation of the Kampala Convention, then as we go forward, the displacement of groups during settings such as post-elections and others, which are conflictual settings, need not, dis they need not cause displacement of, for example, opposition groups or communities, because we will have the implementation of this convention. So we should see situations where no matter what level of national conflict takes place, where member states are implementing the convention, they will be rooting out, or should I say cessation, of the displacement within countries, in those countries that will be implementing. Those are the things that I think would happen in the next five to seven years on the ground. On the second issue, on the issue of um, implementation again, I think um, with all the good intentions indeed at national level, when we move the process forward, there will continue to be lacuna, and George has spoken of them, or loopholes. And questions have been asked by leadership on the issues of complex states, states where there is statelessness, where there is complete breakdown of law and order. And those are issues that will make it more challenging to continue rolling out and then um, monitoring the implementation. But I want to come back and say that we need more region-wide binding uh, covenants for the implementation of the Con Kampala Convention within Africa. We've spoken of ECOWAS, we want to underscore what's happened there, but we want to call for more diplomatic bargaining so that we can have regional implementation of it and more compromise so that we are able to actually do region-specific initiatives to, to, uh, to bring home the Com Kampala Convention. And just to say on the issue of the whole of government, I think that the sharing that I brought really underscored Kenya's policy platform, which is intersectoral and brings the whole of government, government, civil society, philanthropists, private sector, and individuals to the table to support IDPs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, very quickly on where we shall be five to seven years ago, and uh, five years, seven years from now, I'm glad you alluded to the history of the rest of the world. You give that context, and, and, and that is very helpful, because sometimes when we're addressing African issues, we tend to be a historical, which is very, very helpful. I think, uh, like I said, we should look at this convention um, in the context of uh, the development of the African peace and security architecture, you know, because you can't look at it in isolation. Um, you know, and I agree with George that, you know, it is linked to conflict. Uh, it is linked to natural disasters. You know, you can't, you, you can mitigate conflicts, but natural disasters is, an, uh, is the tricky part. But on conflicts, I think Africa is, is really moving ahead. And, and like I said, we are setting norms. In a sh you know, in historical terms, in a very short time, you know, of 10 years, you, and um, um, maybe my elder Francis Deng remembers the days of the OAU, where you couldn't even mention some of the things we are mentioning. And I think, uh, sovereignty has been somehow tampered with. And I think even implementation should be seen in that context that uh, we can keep on pushing, but, uh, but the, really the role of states is at the center of, at the, is at the, center of, of, of the implementation. Uh, and I think there is a realization among Africans that uh, there are things you can't go away with uh, in, in this century. And, and I think that is very important. It should be from, from within. And, uh, uh, institutionally, to me, I think um, uh, it will be a tall order to call for uh, at a regional level. The African Union is is really busy implementing all this architecture that is that is really taking off. Uh, maybe the Commission, the Chairperson's office, I think, uh, in his good offices, will, will really play a role at, at the regional level to really use quiet diplomats and talk to states to implement the convention and and the best practices and can work with the UN. Uh, that's where I see an opportunity, but to create a department within the AU will be, all sub-region organizations will really uh, uh, be a tall order for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adonia. I see at least one more question, uh, even though we are running out of time, so let's take that. Please. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. My name is Franklin. I'm a deputy permanent representative of Gabon. I would like uh, to thank IPI for uh, this very interesting panel. And also, I'd like to thank the panelists for their contribution. I think one of the panelists uh, said, uh, and he was right, that Africa is leading when it comes to creating new norms. I think it's a good thing to, to do that. But the most important thing is to make sure that those new norms are indeed implemented on the ground. So my question is the following. What is being done within the Africa continent to promote this very important convention? To convince those states who haven't done so to really ratify the convention and uh, enhance the political will of Africa to really implement this very important convention. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question on implementation. One more question we can take if there's one. Yes, there's another one in the back. It's on. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Vita Hwasanya. I'm with the Office of Legal Affairs at the UN Secretariat. And uh, I'd like to congratulate all the panelists on a very interesting um, uh, discussion. I had a question um, with regards to what you would perceive is the um, interplay between internally displaced people, particularly in Africa where we have a lot of porous borders and um, refugee status, considering also that the, OA, uh, the AU, OAU convention um, is very broad in its definition of, uh, of refugees and how the Kampala convention envisages um, managing these uh, distinctions. And also I wanted to just see um, comments with regards to the interplay between this um, convention and the whole concept of sustainable development because I think um, pretty much it's probably within a, a sustainable development context within which it would be most effectively implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two questions about the implementation and then the relationship between the internal displaced people and persons and Refugees, we start now with, with Adonia. Please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, um, my brother from Gabon. Uh, the, on the implementation on the ground, I think um, um, this is where I think we should focus. Um, and you are right, we, we are setting norms, but we should also take a lead on implementing them. Um, when this convention was, uh, after the Kampara meeting, it was agreed that uh, ministers dealing with uh, the issues of uh, IDPs and refugees should should meet. You know, not an informal structure should meet, uh, crashing on the goodwill that was generated at the signing. Uh, and I think my minister then, um, uh, prof uh, in the prime minister's office, really was took you know took time. You know, he was passionate about following it up with his colleagues. And I think that's what is being done. And 14. Uh, ratification is uh, is really not uh, a mean achievement. It's something, you know, given between 2009 and now. Uh, and I'm sure by the time we go to the AU summit in uh, in January, more will have ratified. And if they have not, I think that's an opportunity uh, for for ministers to get together and take it forward. Uh, I'm I'm really not myself worried about the ratification. After the ratification, of course, they say the eating is in the pudding. Uh, uh, and I think, and there we can really follow up. And I think uh, uh, a couple of natural disasters that have taken place on the continent, I think maybe my brother George will witness, there has been more sort of, not ideal, but the reaction and, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and the handling of the situation has been different since the convention. Uh, people are aware of standards, human rights issues, and, and all that. Um, um, thank you. And on, on the question of my sister, I think, I've, I don't know how many my, in my African languages in the Great Lakes region, there is no word that it differentiates between an IDP and a refugee. It's only one word. Uh, in, uh, uh, whether you are internally displaced within states or outside, you know, in our social context, it is always, they use the same word and the same culture to describe it. And when it comes to to states, I think the, the line is still blurred, and maybe George here will come in, uh, and the lawyers. Uh, but to me, really, uh, we should 
call on our culture practices and social uh, 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 systems that address the plight of these, whether they cross the borders or stay within the borders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adonia. And Josephine, please. Um, I want to first just make a quick comment on the issue of regional institutions. I still want to underscore the fact that Finland has had a very successful initiative with ECOWAS in the western part of Africa. And as a result, they have, through their uh, continued dialogue and deliberation, gotten the states within <coughs> Western Africa to look at the status of ratification of this convention. And that has been useful to bring friendly pressure to bear on those who had not previously ratified it to do so. And indeed, the turnout of the member states of Western Africa in terms of ratification of this convention improved and can actually be linked closely to this initiative. So I want to underscore the fact that regional uh, initiatives are important and that they need to exist and they need to continually be strengthened, particularly not just for ratification but for the implementation of the same convention and for capacity building initiatives later on. That's very important. I then want to address the issue of sustainable development as was posed by a lady amongst us. And I think she wanted to hear a little bit more about what this convention has to provide or to mitigate against internal displacement as a result of natural disasters. And then the whole issue of moving to sustainable development. And I want to refer her again to my presentation where I talked about what we already have as a policy framework for addressing the issues related to natural disasters and mentioned the need to look at water sources, to look at livestock, to look at health and education. And these would be in the context of an IDP and even where there are porous borders for those who find themselves displaced across borders. I'd like to refer to our recent history with South Sudan, the fact that we actually provided for them in terms of refugee type settings in Kenya for many years. But even when they returned home, there was a need for them in 2007 to come back again. But I want to say that this was possible because when they went home as returnees, there was some infrastructure in place for the initial settlement. But then conflict now brought them back again. So the issue of sustainable development, making sure you have basic social services in place, not only in the IDP setting, in the integrated setting for IDPs later on, and perhaps in the context of refugees and returnees, is a very important part of what we're addressing today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And George, please. <clears throat> I think my task is made much easier in that I'll just add a few things to what my colleagues have said. Um, first of all, on ratifications, as we talk now, seven countries <clears throat> have indicated, both to UNHCR and the African Union, that they are actually in the process of um, um, preparing formal ratification according to their respective uh, procedures. It should be recalled that 33 of the 53 states that are members of the African Union have in fact signed the convention. So if that is indicative of the appetite which is out there to ratify the convention, I think it looks good as uh, my colleague there has said that uh, by the next summit the convention will, will have come into <coughs> In, into full force. Um, the interplay between IDPs and refugees, um, I, I think uh, what, my, uh, what the previous two panelists have said is exactly the same thing that I would also uh, underscore. Perhaps just to, to say that uh, today um, the way in which governments, national governments, regional level, international agencies like that which I work for, IDPs really remain very poor cousins of refugees. If you look at comparable groups, one being an external displacement and the other having remained at home, really their situation is in incomparable. Uh, the, the, the conditions are very bad. There is often um, very limited actual engagement at the level of uh, uh, casework. So although neither the refugee regime nor the convention creates any notion of equalization or parity, clearly what needs to be um, done is to try and close that gap in the way in which we actually deal uh, with um, the plight of people. And Mr. Chairman, so that I can finish here and you don't have to come back to me, um, the, the convention is um, important, as, but it should be seen as really codifying the behavior of peoples and states. Yeah 
In other words, if the convention never came into being, if the convention was never ratified, if it was never implemented by uh, uh, municipal legislation, that should not create an alibi for the things that the convention talks about not being done. Because everything that the convention talks about is goodness in itself, which is already reflected in other instruments, in cultures, in traditions, in behavior which is good in itself. So the time is not some point in the future when the uh, convention comes into being. The time is already now for us to move ahead and give life to what the convention talks about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unless the other panelists would like to have the last word, so I'm just I'm going to conclude this occasion. Thank you very much for all of you coming, and thank you very much for participation very, very actively in, in, in this debate. It certainly it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to make any real conclusions from this very rich discussion. But I, I want to say a couple of things anyway. The fact, I have to say that the Convention for the Protection and Assistance of Internal Displaced Persons in Africa is certainly a milestone achievement. It is homegrown, as was said here, and it's an issue where the African countries certainly have, have taken the lead. And as we heard by, said by many of the here, the issue, key issues, of course, on the implementation. On the UN agenda, we know that the uh, plight of the internal displaced persons is on the agenda very much. And there are two IDP-related resolutions in the third committee this year. One is concerning the assistance to the IDPs in general, another is concerning the African IDPs and refugees. Uh, when speaking about dealing with these matters in, in different committees of the General Assembly, it's good that we had this discussion also because we have to bring these issues to the ground. Very often, whatever we speak in the, in the committees on the General Assembly is very politicized, and, and we live in the microcosm here uh, around the UN, but we have to remember that there's a real world out there and there are real people suffering every day on these matters. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank all the uh, panelists for the contribution and especially I would like to thank IPI for hosting this event. Thank you very much.